welcome to today's episode of Untold Stories of World War II, all about Lieutenant Eichelberger. Uh, my name is Lauren, and I am the Adult Programs Coordinator here at the National Museum of the Pacific War. We are so glad you were able to join us tonight. I'm going to go ahead and introduce our guest speaker for today. Um, his name is John McManus, and he is a professor at Missouri s and and author of a trilogy about the Army in the Pacific Asia. Take it away. Thanks, Lauren. Appreciate it. Uh, thanks so much for this invitation, for doing so much legwork to, to set this up. And uh, I'd like to thank everybody out there. I mean, we've got a lot of people around the country, which is awesome, and hopefully even beyond the country. Um, I'd like to thank all of you for, for taking the, the time and trouble to, to be part of this tonight. Um, I want to give you a sense, as the, the title of the talk uh, would indicate, I want to give you the sense of how uh, Lieutenant General Robert Eichelberger really does have a major effect on the Battle of Biak. And uh, you certainly have a situation that was uh, kind of going off the rails uh, uh, in some ways, and it really does begin to turn around when he gets on site. So um, in terms of like the, the context and the background, if we could go to the, the next slide. Yeah. So you look in here at the, the entire big gulp of a theater here, the Asia Pacific. Now that's about a third of the world's surface of ocean, continent, and island. Uh, so obviously it's massive. And from an American perspective, it's uh, it's kind of been sliced up into three parts of a pie. Um, on the Asian continent, of course, that's uh, known as the China-Burma-India theater. At this point, uh, like in the early months of 1944, and that's Lieutenant General Joseph Stilwell's Ballywack, uh, in which his main preoccupation is an, oncoming, an upcoming campaign in northern Burma to try and create a, a road supply route to uh, to, to China. Uh, the, the significance of that in terms of the larger picture in the Pacific is that, you know, something in the order of about half of the Imperial Japanese Army is tied down in China. And uh, every guy who's in China is one less who's available to fight you somewhere in the Pacific if you're a U.S. or Australian soldier. So, you know, obviously that matters a lot. Um, the actual oceanic Pacific area that you see there, which obviously is the bulk of our map, uh, is uh, divided up in a kind of uneasy compromise arrangement between the Army and the Navy, uh, neither of which is really willing to submit to the authority of the other, the, the absolute authority of the other. Uh, and so uh, the Central Pacific and northern and southern portion of the Southern Pacific is under Admiral Chester Nimitz, of course, who obviously <laughs> is near and dear to everybody's heart to, to, at the museum and beyond. And he's got, of course, multi-service um, forces under his command. Um, the bulk of his ground forces are Marine, but he's also got a lot of Army ground forces. Obviously, he's got major fleets, so on and so forth. He has Army Air Forces assets, too. Um, in what's called the Southwest Pacific Area, or SWAPA, that's under, obviously, um, General Douglas MacArthur, who's an, an Army officer and controls much of what you see on the, on the map there. So if you look in there, you see that blue line through New Guinea uh, and uh, leading up almost to the, the Philippines. So it, that is kind of the, the bulk of MacArthur's theater with Australia as the key base. But increasingly, of course, by mid-1944, New Guinea is as well. And, and uh, uh, of course, MacArthur's main preoccupation is going to be to get to the Philippines. So, yeah, if we take a look at him here, we see him in all his, his uh, splendor with his corncob pipe and his sunglasses. Um, famous image of MacArthur. And you can tell this is uh, earlier in December 1944, because uh, in December, he was promoted to, to five-star general. So you can see he's got the four stars on his collar here. So um, MacArthur, of course, has, has emerged, uh, certainly in his own mind, but in the minds of many others, as kind of the, the, the lead character of the, of the war against Japan. And uh, obviously, he's been at it since the beginning when he uh, commanded Allied forces in the Philippines, was forced out of there, so on and so forth. So um, what is he doing as we get into to like April and May 1944? Well, MacArthur's forces had, um, uh, had, had really spent the better part of almost two years uh, trying to negotiate their way, of course, the, across New Guinea, which is a huge island, obviously. And so um, at that point, uh, sort of the difference maker for him is a... a uh, an outflanking amphibious invasion that had happened at Hollandia in April 1944 that accelerates the pace of his operations uh, and thus makes um, these operations in New Guinea and beyond feasible by that kind of May-June time frame. Okay, so uh, where he is is he's desperate, really, to kind of wrap up um, 
the operations on New Guinea and anything sort of to the northwest of it so that he can get to the Philippines. He's very concerned uh, that the Joint Chiefs of Staff back in Washington, D.C. are going to kind of backbench him and Swapa in the war uh, and put all the resources into Nimitz's uh, more f- sort of, you know, more dramatic on some levels, island hopping campaign across the Central Pacific. But also the advantage of geography is that's, you know, basically pointed straight towards Tokyo. His is more on the flanks. But as MacArthur sees it, um, the the operations in his uh, theater are every bit as important. But in some ways to him, liberating the Philippines is really the main purpose of the war, every bit as much as beating the Japanese. So that's kind of where he's coming from. Uh, I think you all probably know enough about him to know that that he's, uh, you know, quite vainglorious, uh, sometimes megalomaniacal and egomaniacal and all these kinds of things. Uh, but if there's, if there's one thing he isn't, it's boring. Um, he's he's fascinating, and, and I think you're going to see him in this context here, how he affects this battle of Biak. Um, so um, the, the other sort of main character, if we go ahead, one is uh, is this guy, Lieutenant General Robert Eichelberger, who is really our, our sort of star of the show this evening. Uh, where does Eichelberger fit in relation to MacArthur? Well, Eichelberger had uh, had come to Swapa in uh, in uh, like mid 1942 as the commander of what was called I Corps. Nowadays, in the army, that corps still exists, but it's called First Corps. It's the Roman numeral one. So in World War II, they tended to call it I Corps. So Eichelberger had um, had uh, had come to the theater, and he had actually won the first American ground victory of World War II in the Battle of Buna. And that happens at the end of 1942 and the very, very beginning of 1943. It wraps up like January 3rd, 1943. Um, he had proven himself then and later just to be a remarkable dynamic commander. Um, he is he's a lead from the front kind of guy. He's, he's extraordinarily courageous. He is, uh, in terms of his personality, he's he's very warm. He's very witty. He has friends all over the army. He's he's really hard to dislike uh, on many levels, um, you know. And he's he's a very inspirational kind of guy. And we know a lot about him because he he writes to his uh, his absolute soulmate uh, Emma, um, his his wife Emma. He writes to her two, sometimes three times a day, even while combat is going on, while he's circularly around fighting, which is just amazing. And then, and then after the war, he has these kind of really voluminous dictations about everything he remembers about the war, and and, and so on and so forth. So, Eichelberger, um, by mid 1944, had had overseen the successful Hollandia operation, and then every bit of significantly the the logistical buildup that followed, uh, which was going to allow MacArthur's forces to press on farther to the to the west and, and towards the Philippines, um, so he's absorbed with that as we get into May and early June 1944, and he's kind of waiting. He's gotten a whiff in the air that uh, there's going to be enough forces in theater for him to get his own army level command. That's the next step up from Corps. So he was about to get command of Eighth Army. So if we look here. Um, you can see, and it's it's a busy map, but it but it really does show you um, precisely where Nimitz's forces and MacArthur's are going to be operating in this actual time frame. So, right in the sort of middle to, to upper right portion of the map, you can see the Marianas. Now, uh, that's where that's where Nimitz's forces are headed in in the summer of 1944. In what's called Operation Forager to capture three key islands: um, Saipan, Tinian, and Guam. Uh, and, and I would argue that that is really sort of the pivot point of the Pacific War on many levels. It's, it's really quite analogous to what Normandy is to, to, the, to uh, the European theater, you know, that, uh, you know, when the Japanese lose in the Marianas, they're really in some trouble. So Nimitz is husbanding major forces to push uh, towards the Marianas and then to the south. If you're looking there at uh, the bottom of our map, uh, like northwest New Guinea, and then you can kind of see beyond that, you can see the, the Palaws, and then you can see the doorstep on the way to the to the Philippines, okay? So this is where your Swapa forces are going to be operating, um, you know, during this exact same time frame. And just by looking at that, at the extreme western part of New Guinea, you can see Biak, B-I-A-K, and... Um, just because of where it's located, it now all of a sudden in 1944, a place that had been completely irrelevant, really, uh, throughout most of human history, and, and really, honestly, a kind of a godforsaken place, 
Now it becomes of central importance because whoever controls it can project air power in many different directions, um, you know, to the north to support Nimitz, uh, to the west to support operations in the Philippines, or from a Japanese perspective, uh, to thwart all of that and to, to menace MacArthur's forces that are still on New Guinea. Um, so again, it's it's one of these odd little convergences. We see this. We saw this with Guadalcanal earlier in in the war, uh, a place no one knew much of anything about. Now, sort of takes a central role. And um, I, I love this this quote about it by a war correspondent who who ends up being there in the invasion. And he writes about Biak. He says it's the most useless land ever tossed up out of the sea, and one of the better haunts of malaria, dysentery, yaws, tropical ulcers, mosquitoes, flies, and crocodiles. Um, you know, so the place is basically like a, a narrow coastline with volcanic hills and a lot of caves, and that's going to matter. So what's there? Uh, Biak is defended by 11,400 Japanese as of late May 1944. The bulk of the forces are from the 222nd Infantry Regiment. These are veterans of the war in China who have, in spite of a, a, a really major U.S. submarine presence throughout the Pacific by now, they have made it to Biak more or less intact. And they've been able to fortify. Now they've also got light tanks, they got artillery, they got engineers, a lot of naval troops. There's a mishmash of people. Uh, the people who are part of that infantry regiment are the minority of the forces, but um, you know, almost any Japanese who's willing to fight to the death could be very formidable in a cave or, or another defensive position. Colonel uh, Naoki Kazume is uh, is the, the commanding officer of the 222nd, so he's supposed to be in control of the the Biak defenses. Um, what does uh, SWAPA intelligence, MacArthur's intelligence section, believe is there? Um, they believe there's maybe about half as many Japanese as there really are. And this is a constant tendency uh, in the Pacific Asia War, uh, especially for, for uh, uh, Major General Charles Willoughby, who is MacArthur's intel officer. He just has this sort of distressing habit of getting things wrong. Um, he's got a lot of advantages, aerial recon. Uh, of course, they're, they're intercepting and decoding uh, a lot of Japanese uh, military communications. We all know that, obviously. Um, there's coast watchers. There's, you know, anything you can imagine, you've got these advantages. Uh, and yet it's tough to estimate if you don't have human intel on the ground. It can be tough. So um, the, the Americans had created something called Alamo Scouts uh, not, not long before this. And these were sort of recon guys who are uh, highly trained, uh, very elite, handpicked kind of uh, soldiers whose job is to go in to a potential invasion site or wherever, not to get into combat, to basically recon and figure out uh, the, the size and scale and strength of any Japanese defenses. Um, so are they going to be used here at Biak? The answer to that is no. Uh, the, the, uh, the commander who controls them, Lieutenant General Walter Kruger, more on him in a few moments, um, uh, feels it's just too risky that we'll be telegraphing our punch uh, if he sends them into Biak that the Japanese will know we're coming. What he doesn't know, what we historians know, is that the Japanese knew that an American invasion was coming. They just didn't know the exact time frame. Uh, and they're going to be surprised by the by the timing of it, but not the actual invasion itself. So here's the uh, here's the plan. Um, if we can go ahead. Yeah. Oh, oh, another thing I want to tell you about before, before going on to Biak. Okay, so... It's important to understand, really to bear this in mind, is that even though Hollandia has succeeded massively, it's really one of the, the most dramatic American victories of the war against Japan, um, it has created some complications. It doesn't mean that the fighting in New Guinea is over. Now, you're looking there and the, see the bottom uh, map? Okay, that shows you something of the almost the full expanse of the northwest coast of New Guinea. You can see Hollandia right almost smack dab in the middle there, okay? So... Um, yeah, you've outflanked the Japanese to the east and the west, but they're still there. And yeah, as you all know, the Japanese don't just go away and surrender. I mean, they decide either to hunker down and fight to the death or to come out and fight and harass you, whatever they're going to do. And so um, a lot of MacArthur's forces, uh, and these are all army forces. The army is doing, by the way, does the bulk of the, the fighting in the, in the war against Japan and, and almost all the invasions. Um, so in this case, you can see that both east and west, MacArthur's forces are fighting these kind of cleanup operations against outflanked Japanese who are determined to cost the Americans lives and time. Now, in the top right, you see the Battle of Drinium or River. Uh, now, that develops a little bit later, uh, primarily in July and August, but it's also it's beginning to bubble 
as of June. And you can see all the combat power, it's tying down there to the east of Hollandia. Before that, that's not, you know, we're not wrapped up with that until September. So that's absorbing a lot of time and headspace. To the west, where you see uh, the, the top left map at Lone Tree Hill, see how it says May, June, 1944? Okay, so the Army 6th Infantry Division is fighting its other Japanese forces there to the west, who are hoping, just like their comrades to the east, to attack uh, and maybe uh, damage the American base at Hollandia or or just cost them lives and time. Okay, so a lot of Kruger 6th Army, which is subordinate to MacArthur, of which these units are a part, is tied down in these operations. Okay, uh, if we move on. Okay, so here's the plan for Biak. Um, you're going to have two regiments from the 41st Infantry Division land there on 27th May 1944. Um who are these guys? Well, they have combat experience in this war. They fought, uh, this was a, a battle parallel to the Battle of Buna in 1942. It was called San Ananda. Uh, so they had fought there, a uh, very successful unit. They'd uh, really been trained quite well, especially for jungle war by this point. And they've been nicknamed by the Japanese, the Bloody Butchers. Um, and so they had totally leaned into that, that uh, they, they loved that moniker. And uh, there were some of these guys who even printed up cards uh, showing a uh, like a GI with uh, you know butcher's knives and a, and a Japanese cowering in the background, about to presumably about to be slaughtered or whatever. And so, uh, the bloody butchers were were a highly trained um, amphibious force. So two regiments from that division, the 162nd and the 186th, are going to land on on May the 27th. Um, and remember, you know they're going to be outnumbered. Because the two regiments, that's probably about 5,000 plus U.S. soldiers, uh, you know, maybe about six. And remember, there's uh, almost twice that many Japanese on the island. But again, this is a product of the the, the bad intel uh, from Willoughby on down that we have at this point. So uh, the Americans have kind of underestimated the Japanese. What do we want on Biak? Well, as I indicated earlier, this is about air power. Um, so we want airfields. And they're really the bulk of the fighting, spot a lot of the arrows that you see on that map. Um, the bulk of the fighting at Biak is going to take place at that, that southern part of the island, that kind of southern coastal area where, near where they come ashore, um, along that narrow strip of coast and where there's a lot of coral ridges and caves and, and, uh, and uh, some, some pretty heavy foliage, okay? So that's where the bulk of the Japanese defenses are to protect the airfields, as you might imagine, okay? So uh, pretty soon... When, when uh, the bloody butchers come ashore, they, they run into some pretty fierce resistance. Um, they're going to attempt to take the airfield quickly, uh, but they're soon pinned down, and uh, some of them even isolated in the, the um, air, area of the, the airfields. The carnage is just simply awful, and I'll give you some quotes from the people who were there. I wasn't there. Um, I think they can tell you better than I. Uh, we had some awful wounded men, Private Thomas Smith said. Legs and arms gone, eyes gone. Several had as many as 15 holes in them. Uh, war correspondent Spencer Davis um, later wrote about an aid station that he was observing. He described it as, quote, crowded with maimed and dying American soldiers, boys with shattered legs, bloody head wounds and faces half shot away. With shocking frequency, I saw medical aides shake their heads and draw a blanket over a shattered form. And so this is pretty bad. Uh, within the first day or two, it's pretty apparent this isn't going to be a cakewalk. So they, they land the reserve regiment. The, any uh, U.S. Army division had three infantry regiments, so they put now they have all three of them ashore. Uh, but they're pretty quickly just sort of bogged down and, and ensnared in this terrible stalemate, more along the, more or less along that southern coast like you see there. Uh, the Japanese, the, the pattern is that they're firing down at the Americans from the vantage point of their fortified caves. And that's sort of the, the nut of the problem. You're on that lower ground, that narrow coastal strip. Uh, the Japanese have those coral ridges beyond, and there are many of them are in caves. So they have a real advantage in that respect. Okay, so next one, I'm going to introduce you to it. To, yeah, I mean, again, yeah, see. Okay, so if you're looking at the, the sort of green parts uh, that you see just inland, though, that's sort of the network of Japanese defenses along that, that sort of ridge line and, and where some of the caves are. And some of them even closer to the water as well. It's it's a lot of layers to this. So there's just innumerable caves. Um, the airfield you can see on the on the left there, where you see the red arrows, uh, where you're going to have Japanese counterattacks against the the airfields, and then the landing areas, the primarily ones, are to the right. So you can see how you're kind of funnelized here, and how you could be pinned down close to the water. 
Uh, so that's that's the general pattern, especially with the 162nd and the 186 initially, but eventually with, with all three regiments, you're going to have them kind of just bogged down right there, and it's a bit of a stalemate. So two main characters here. I mentioned one of them a moment ago. On the left is uh, Lieutenant General Walter Kruger, who commands Sixth Army, uh, of which this operation is a part. Okay, to his right is Major General Horace Fuller, who commands the 41st Division uh, that has obviously gone ashore at, uh, at, at Biak. Kruger is, is, is just a fascinating guy. He's, um, he's actually born in Germany in, uh, in 1881. Uh, his father was in the German army, but his father died when Kruger was a boy. And so uh, Kruger uh, is, uh, is going to immigrate to the United States with his mother, um, joins the army at age 17 in 1898 as a private, and he retires almost a half a century later as a four-star general. Um, so he's had this sort of um, Horatio Alger type military story here of coming up through the ranks and being commissioned, um, you know, just, just from, from the ranks. And so he, uh, um, by 1944, by this point, is in command of more U.S. ground forces than any other American general in the Pacific. Uh, so remember, though, he's juggling a lot of balls. Remember, Drenia Moore, Lone Tree Hill, the Hollandia buildup, all this kind of stuff. He's got MacArthur, who's back in Australia, by the way, completely distant from this battle. He's got MacArthur breathing down his neck, uh, saying, hey, you know, what's going on with these various battles? How quickly can we get Beak? MacArthur will often tend to send out these communiques once troops are safely ashore as if the battle is over and, uh, you know, when it's just starting. And so Kruger's under pressure from MacArthur. And Kruger, though he's really a quite a strong, competent commander, um, one flaw he's got is his personality is really abrasive and brusque. He's incredibly insensitive, and he uh, he's prone to, to tremendous rudeness. Um, so he's kind of remote from this battle. He never visits Biak because he's dealing with all this other stuff on New Guinea. In retrospect, he probably should have visited Biak to get a good sense of what was going on there himself, uh, but he doesn't. Uh, Fuller, uh, Horace Fuller uh, was absolutely uh, idolized in the 41st Division, uh, and at the beginning of this battle, he had uh, really been sort of groomed for corps command, for, for promotion to, to command of multiple divisions, okay? Um, so that's where he is at the beginning, but he is just as stunned as everybody else once they come ashore to find out what they're really facing. And he's trying hard, and he's attempting to lead, but he's not having success. And so now we're getting deeper into June. We're almost into the middle part of June. MacArthur's angry back in Australia. Kruger's angry in, uh, in, in New Guinea. Um, Fuller is, is just near his wit's end. Uh, he's, a, he's a very heavy smoker. He's not, and that's definitely intruding upon his, uh, his anxiety, his, his sleep patterns. Um, he's just not always thinking clearly. He's not visiting the front that much, which is a little surprising because he's a pretty inspirational guy on some levels. And so um, he's, he's begging for reinforcements from Kruger, uh, and Kruger will make them available, but Kruger is, has has sent all these messages to Fuller. What's going on? Speed it up. We're really not happy, and all this. And so uh, Fuller is getting incredibly angry with uh, with Kruger. He is is getting to the point where he absolutely hates him. Okay, so enter Eichelberger. Um, yeah, here's here's an example of the the caves they're facing. So if you look closely, you'll notice those are men at the bottom of our image there. So you can see like the size of a man and then look at the cave compared to that. Uh, so imagine that as a Japanese commander, how you can fortify that. Uh, and that's that's typical of some caves on Biak, not all, of course. But and then on to the next one to give you a sense, too. This is what a lot of the other terrain is like. Um, just this heavy bramble. You can see tanks and infantry trying to move forward and the Japanese could be anywhere. And some of the ridge lines beyond in our image there and the caves and who knows what visibility could be really, really limited. OK, so that's what Fuller and his guys are dealing with. Um, that's what Kruger doesn't quite understand. He sends two key staffers to to be to, to figure out this situation before he before uh, Eichelberger comes aboard. And, and it's a weird dynamic because <laughs> the the the, uh, the two staff officers are outranked by Fuller, but they're there to evaluate him and to, to give a recommendation to their boss whether they ought to keep this guy on or not. Really weird deal. Very dysfunctional. Uh, Kruger himself probably should have gone there. Uh, so 
the staffers say, well, no, Fuller should remain in command, but he needs help. And uh, so that's when you're going to have another regiment come ashore, and that's the 34th Infantry Regiment from the 24th Division. And that's when Kruger's going to um, basically contact Eichelberger and say, hey, can you go there and command it like a task force? So like more than a division? And then Fuller will just control his division, and you'll control everything above him like as a de facto corps commander, if that makes sense. So um, Eichelberger... Uh, just like he'd been summoned earlier in the war during a crisis, like during the Battle of Buna. Now here he is again. And so you see him here with two of his key staff officers. Um, on the left is Clovis Byers, who is his chief of staff, and they are truly like brothers. Uh, they have an amazing relationship, and they're, they're very devoted to each other. It's a, it's a really successful um, command arrangement. On his right is uh, uh, Bob Bowen, his operations officer, who's also extraordinarily successful. So um, Eichelberger gets there on, uh, like, I think it's June, you know, like mid-June, June 16th, 17th, um, around that time frame. And um, he is going to have to kind of estimate, what's the situation? How am I going to deal with this? And there's another dynamic at play, too. He and Fuller were West Point classmates in the class of 1909. And um, he does not want to fire Fuller. He's not going to. Uh, he'd had to fire a classmate at Buna, uh, Major General Forrest Harding, and it had kind of scarred Eichelberger because Eichelberger was a very nice person, but he's also a very ruthless warrior, too. That That's hard to reconcile the two, isn't it? So um, so Eichelberger comes to, to, to Biek, and he's just stunned by Fuller's attitude because Fuller is just like, I'm done with Kruger. Uh, I'm finished with this, and uh, I, I'm just not continuing. And so he decides he's going to resign. And Eichelberger desperately tries to talk him out of it, uh, like as a friend, a colleague, and all this. And as, But as I later put it, I begged him to stay on and guaranteed to look after his welfare, but his hatred of Kruger was beyond belief. Um, so like in a fit of peak, Fuller basically quits, and he never has a combat command again. So so much for the Corps command or any other command. It's kind of the end for him. And so now Eichelberger is having to sort of run the whole show himself, um, and he spends a couple days gathering info, resting, refitting the troops, uh, trying to rebuild morale because he understands that's part of the problem is people not seeing, you know, how this thing can, can turn out well or how they're going to be supported or, or, or how they're going to survive, you know. So um, what he does in the wake of that is he takes the forces he's got. So the whole 41st Division plus the 34th plus engineers plus tanks. And he's going to invest in this kind of enveloping attack. Um, and the, the new um, 41st Division commander, a guy named Jens Doe, uh, who's, who's all 100% warrior, is totally against one element of the attack because he's worried that when Eichelberger tries that flanking move, they're going to run into it's a heavy Japanese mortar or fire. Um, and uh, they argue about it. They argue about it. And this also to Eichelberger's credit, I think, too. Doe is not a yes man at all. He's the opposite. Uh, but he is a really effective warrior. And Eichelberger understands that. And he's like, you know what? The guy may be a pain in the rear sometimes and argumentative and whatever, but he's a good fighter. He's a competent soldier. And I like that he tells me the truth. So Eichelberger doesn't want yes men around him. Um, so this is, again, a pretty successful team in that that attack absolutely succeeds magnificently. This is like June 18th and 19th. And, um, um, he gets a break in that there's no mortar fire uh, on that, that flanking attack. Uh, they, they take no casualties and they, they get to the cave. Sometimes that's the problem, getting to the cave in order to destroy it. Um, and so Biak then becomes for the next few days, like two to three days, just this kind of incremental fight uh, cave by cave against the Japanese. And uh, with, which no side giving quarters at all. Um, so within a matter of just a few days, Eichelberger has turned the situation around. The, the next image shows you also how. Uh, here's an image of him. You can see he's got a Thompson submachine gun there. And that's really how this guy operates. Um, at Buna in December 1942, he was at the front every day, leading basically like as a squad leader. Uh, he lost uh, something over about 25, 30 pounds in the space of a month, uh, leading in that situation. Here he is again, leading um, assaults on caves. Um, <laughs> and when he wanted to find out something, he's right there himself. Um, good commanders are also lucky, too, sometimes. And he's lucky that he doesn't get hit. He could have been hit and killed, uh, but he wasn't, you know. So 
There are many times he has close calls, uh, but he's able to affect the situation really quite productively. Uh, so he puts a lot more fight into the American soldiers who were there. As uh, one of their, their uh, officers or later put it, he says, to the average GI, the Japanese is no more than a yellow rat. And this is the reality of the war. Horrible as that is, they have no use for them and uh, just shoot them like anyone can kill a rattlesnake. Um, so they're burning them out of the caves. Engineers are, are blowing them up with satchel charges. Uh, they're using gasoline. They're pouring that into the caves and igniting it with white phosphorus. They're using tanks, uh, direct assault by infantry, artillery, like self-propelled artillery to fire in there. But once these th that Japanese defensive network is broken, um, now it's a matter of just, just eliminating these isolated pockets of Japanese. And uh, Kazume, of course, is, is going to die in the midst of this fighting, probably committing ritual harikari. Um, and, and you just sort of destroy them one by one, and they can no longer pin you down at the airfield uh, and menace that. So Army aviation engineers, who are a huge part of this war in terms of building airfields, here, as in many places, come in and uh, start to build airfields that you're going to base bombers on and all that. And so they're also going to have to clean up the mess, too, because there's hundreds of Japanese bodies everywhere. One of the engineers later said there was a stench that hung over that island that you wouldn't believe. There were big blow flies all over the place. Um, bodies swelled up to three times their size and burst. Um, you know, you can just imagine what that was like. So uh, by June 22nd and 23rd, the battle is essentially decided, though, as always, there's isolated Japanese that have to be dealt with over the next several weeks. But you get strategically out of Biak what you wanted. Uh, so... Eichelberger has pulled off this master stroke um, and really won a key victory for, for Kruger and MacArthur. The Japanese garrison is more or less annihilated. I think the Americans take 200 prisoners. The Americans suffer 9,790 casualties, uh, but about two thirds of them were to disease. Uh, most of them are gonna survive. So uh, we have 405 American fatalities and another 2,100 wounded. So um, just, you know, very anonymous battle. In the in the sort of broad scheme of World War II, but very important the, in in creating the momentum and the air support to to move on to the Philippines and thereafter. And the person who's had more to do with it than any is uh, is certainly Robert Eichelberger. So I'll stop there, and I want to leave plenty of time for questions and uh, uh, and comments or whatever. Sorry, I was writing down questions. <laughs> Uh, so thank you so much for sharing the story with us and for your time to do this presentation. We really appreciate it. Uh, now is the time for our at-home audience. If you have any questions, please type them into the chat box uh, and we'll start asking those questions. Um, I, I see a comment that I'd like to recognize, Kelly Taylor. I don't know if you can see it, John, uh, but her dad was at... Uh, in 1944 in the uh, 503rd? 503rd, uh, what? Uh, PRCT. Let's see. Oh, Parachute okay. Infantry Regiment? Hmm. Ooh, okay. Um, Interesting. So I I have a, a sort of an overall question for you mm -hmm. uh, that I jotted down just right at the end. So um, you closed out with you know, not a lot of people know about this battle. It's one of those unknown islands uh, that we fought over. Is there something that you wish people in general knew about this battle? Like if there's a takeaway? Yeah. It, what would it be? Yeah, there, there's a couple, you know, and I, I think one is to think of the larger context that this is going on while the Battle of Normandy is happening and it's going on while D-Day happens. So, you know, we remember D-Day very well, obviously, but this is happening too. And, uh, and it's important. Um, in terms of patterns, you know, okay, yes, the Americans get strategically what they want out of Biak. That's good. But in terms of the pattern of how the war is going to be fought, Biak is a, is a really kind of a menacing harbinger. Okay, so what I mean by that is that the Japanese at Biak, really almost by improvisation, um, are going to, to start to figure out, you know, we can't quite stop the Americans at the waterline, so we're going to think of an inland defense, and we're going to use the best terrain we can for that. And that tends to be caves. So as the war starts to migrate north, um, you're, it's what will characterize it is not as much jungle warfare as there had been and more and more cave warfare. And of course, most infamously, you're going to see it three months later at Peleliu and by the way, at Angar, 
which is another battle fought right next door to Peleliu by the Army's 81st Infantry Division, but also obviously infamously at Iwo Jima, Okinawa, um, Leyte, other places in the Philippines. So Biak is really a, a kind of disturbing harbinger in, in that sense of how the war is going to be fought. And if there's maybe one takeaway to remember about it, I think maybe that's that's the one. All right. We have some other questions that have come in from our at-home audience. So uh, first one, uh, how long did we use Biak before moving on? Um, we use it the rest of the war. Uh, it's going to be a, a, a bomber base, a resupply base, uh, it, you know. So, of course, as we get farther north in the Philippines, it becomes less and less important. And obviously, as Nimitz's forces uh, move north from the Marianas, it will as well. It's like a lot of places uh, that we fight hard for, Guadalcanal forward. Um, they're really important for a while, and then they're they're kind of backbenched as as the war moves on. Not all that different, I think, than the pattern you see in uh, in Europe. Uh, Naples is of central importance to the Allied armies in uh, September October 1943. By the by uh, the latter part of 1944, you know, not quite as much. Um, same thing in in France. Uh, so um, in, in that sense, I don't think it's too much different than what you're seeing in many other battlefields. But um, be a did it have to be fought? I think probably, probably it did. Uh, you know, I, what I hadn't mentioned too is that the the Japanese Navy had been considering uh, fighting a showdown battle there once the Americans invaded Biak. Um, instead, of course, they're going to fight their showdown battle in the Marianas because there's bigger game uh, to hunt there in terms of the U.S. fleet. Uh, so, you know, the Japanese lose some level of interest in it as well. But uh, the airfields there we use for the rest of the war. Okay, our next question up is, how much has been written on Biak outside of your own works? Uh, not much, honestly. It's, uh, I mean, it's, you know, mentioned in the Army's official histories. Uh, there's there's a really good personal firsthand account from it uh, by, by uh, Francis uh, Bernie Catanzaro, who was uh, a rifleman in the 41st Division, and his book is called, his memoir is called With the 41st Division. Um, and that tells you everything about what the Battle of Biak was like. Um, Eichelberger's chemical weapons officer, Harold Regelman, wrote an interesting book called The Caves of Biak. And I, I, it's fascinating because it's just all about how they were fighting in the caves and, and everything he was doing in terms of, uh, you know, the white phosphorus I was talking about and, and whatever else. And, he, you know, he said, too, that um, and I, I don't know if this is true, but this is what he claimed. He said that, uh, that Eichelberger was considering using captured stocks of Japanese poison gas there before Regelman persuaded him. Um, I, I never found any reference that Eichelberger had to that the rest of his, his life. Maybe he just wanted to conveniently forget that. I don't know. Um, but also Eichelberger's uh, memoir, Our Jungle Road to Tokyo, is, a, is an excellent look too. But the, you won't find, to my knowledge, any kind of single book that you can find in the Battle of Biak that would give you a really good overview of the air, land, sea battle. Okay. Uh, next up, we have, what did Eichelberger command after this battle? Yeah, that's an interesting story, too. So so Eichelberger, uh, you know, having wrapped this up, goes back to, to Hollandia at the, at the end of June. And um, already there was uh, some tension between Kruger and him. And I think this is so fascinating. Um, on some levels, they were so alike. They were both very committed military professionals. They were both very honest people. Um, they were both very ethical people on, on many levels. They were both, I think, quite courageous. Um, they were both excellent husbands to, to their wives. And, uh, you know, so they had a lot in common, but their personalities were really kind of oil and water because... Kruger was so brusque, so rude, so insensitive, and Eichelberger couldn't fathom that. He couldn't fathom treating people that way. He was very solicitous of other people's feelings. And, and uh, so he comes back to, to <laughs> Hollandia, and uh, Eichelberger, if there's one thing that sort of animates him, it's wanting to, to kind of distinguish and achieve things and, and whatnot and get the accolades for it. Um, he's kind of similar to his classmate and close friend, George Patton. Um, they, and they kept in touch during the war. They're, they're very similar, you know, in terms of how they fight and, and liking the idea of accolades. So he gets back there and Kruger, you know, I mean, just, just completely, um, 
how would I put it? Not humiliates him, but he's he's so brusque to him, and he just says, "Congratulations on your success," and he, he just leaves, you know. And he says, um, and he, and uh, Eichelberg says, "Well, I can tell you all about the battle if you want to learn from it." He's like, "I'm not going to have time to talk to you," you know, just just things like that. And so Eichelberger's attitude toward Kruger really hardens at that point, uh, and he really really came to detest him. Um, Kruger didn't much like Eichelberger, not not really personality wise, but he thought he was too. Um, too generous and nice with uh, with people who weren't cutting it, you know, especially on his staff or whatever. Um, so what happens is that they become very uncomfortable peers. Uh, Eichelberger gets promoted to command Eighth Army, and so whereas Eichelberger had sort of worked for Kruger, uh, now he no longer does, and so I don't think Kruger was too wild about that either, because uh, he also obviously had seniority and, and was older than Eichelberger as well. Okay, I think we have time for one last question before we wrap it up. And I might need Mark to add some more details into his question because um, we moved on a little bit from what you were referring to. So his question is, do the higher ups miss this trend that you just talked about in reference to the, the defenses that you mentioned? Yeah, if we're, you know, if we're <laughs> speaking of the higher ups like at uh, in MacArthur's headquarters, say, uh, I think they kind of do because it's, it's just still the same pattern for Willoughby. Um, what really motivates Willoughby as he prepares his intel um, is what he thinks MacArthur wants. He's sort of the ultimate yes man. Now, Willoughby's a smart guy. Don't get me wrong. He really is a smart guy. He's actually incredibly uh, well-versed and knowledgeable on, on military history, and, and uh, he's very perceptive on some levels, but he's also um, very culturally myopic and, uh, and very racist in his outlook. And so this is a real weakness for him. So throughout the war, before and after this, regardless of all the assets he's got, um, he's going to, <laughs> the main consideration is usually going to be whatever he thinks MacArthur wants to hear. And, uh, and usually that means underestimating the Japanese, sometimes on a, on a kind of racial level too, to be honest. Um, so sometimes, sometimes Willoughby does reasonably well. Um, <laughs> Most of the time he doesn't, and you're going to see the same thing at Luzon, which is, by the way, just about the biggest battle of the the, the uh, war against Japan for the Americans. I mean, he's going to dramatically underestimate the the Japanese military presence there. So I don't think, if you're wondering, Mark, that uh, like, are there lessons learned about how to estimate the defenses and, and do the intel? Um, I don't think there's enough lessons learned, um, except for this. Let me let me say one caveat. At the tactical level of, uh, you know, like company and battalion and regimental, even division command, how to deal with caves. Yeah, there, there's a lot of thinking about that and a, and a lot of circulation in like army pamphlets, uh, um, memos written after the battle, uh, AARs and critiques, all that kind of stuff. And it's circulated not just in the Pacific, but also in Europe. There's a lot of lessons learned shared all over the army in the course of the war. So those who fight at Biak and uh, and also elsewhere in some of these other operations are going to be thinking along those lines. And, and I do think in terms of how to fight, they're going to be learning those lessons. In terms of the intel, I don't think maybe we learn quite as many lessons as we perhaps could have. Okay, well, thank you at home audience for all of your um, really insightful questions. I really appreciate you staying with us. We went a little bit long, but I think it was well worth it. Uh, so before we go, I just want to remind everybody that we have our upcoming monthly daytime webinar uh, entitled From Midway to Guadalcanal, Two Months That Changed the Pacific War with our guest speaker, John Parshall. And that will be on July 17th at 1 p.m. Central. So be sure to register for that event. And I look forward to seeing you then. Also, we have our conference, formerly known as Symposium. That will be on September 20th and 21st. We'll have a reception on the 20th. And then the main programming will happen on the 21st. As you can see from our slide here, it is about the Manhattan Project. Uh, so that is all I have for us this evening. Again, thank you so much, John, for uh your presentation tonight and thank you for our at home audience for joining us and i hope to see you next month